So hello everyone, and thank you for joining uh, this um, Mindful Science keynote by Dr. Felipe Jane today. Dr. Jane will be sharing with us uh, regarding a new mindfulness and guided imagery approach to facilitate mentalization and reduce depression in uh, caregivers, work that he's been doing for some years, initially starting at UCLA as a postdoc and faculty and now at Harvard. And Felipe is a, a, a long time friend of mine and colleague who has been uh, really pioneering a particular aspect of uh, intervention and thinking in the realm of mindfulness and meditation, which has to do with mentalization, uh, a psychological construct that he'll be sharing about today, and which certainly does overlap with some uh, key constructs in the understanding of mindfulness, meta-awareness, and um, uh, the sense of feeling connected to and aware of other people's internal worlds. So this intervention that Dr. Jane has, has uh, pioneered, you know, developed and then explored its efficacy uh, is really provides a an, an great starting point to think about mentalization in relationship to mindfulness. And I'm hoping that we have some interesting discussion about that. A little bit about Felipe. He's uh, currently Director of Healthy Aging Studies at Massachusetts General Hospital in the Clinical De Depression and Clinical Research Program. He's also Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard and Associate Director of the Psychopathology and Introduction to Clinical Psychiatry course in the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. I'm going to... Uh, leave the rest of the introduction and background uh, for your interest in this area of work, Felipe, to you, and turn it over. Um, thank you again for being with us today. Really looking forward to this presentation. Well, thank you very much, Rael, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm really honored to have been invited to speak here today and to share with you uh, some of my work and to share with uh, everyone who's joined us um, about uh, mentalizing imagery therapy. But to start, I really want to share with you where I come from in this. What, what does it mean to me? And that will also help you to understand some of the exercises that we do in mentalizing imagery therapy and why we do them. So uh, it's, it's very well known from brain and psychological science that one of the first things that we process about another person is, are they a part of our tribe or are they not a part of our tribe? And uh, today you're hearing from someone who has a rather unusual name, uh, Felipe Jane, and uh, uh, there are different components to all of that. Um, you know, who may or may not have a similar skin color to you. Um, and it's important to just get that out of the way so that we can see some of the commonalities. I have been doing this work now for, for more than a decade of developing these techniques. Um, and um, I'm going to share my screen with you um, so that you can um, follow along here a bit. So. Um, let's look at this uh, for a moment. So, so why am I showing you a picture of a wave, of an ocean wave? It really is because this is our universe, right? This is, this is who we are in relation to something. It's who we are in relation to some kind of a power from which we all emerge, you could say. Um, so by power, you could say force, um, you could describe it using physical quantities, some people describe it in a spiritual sense, but whichever way you describe it, there's no denying that we're part of one whole, and that if we really think about it, uh, on the day-to-day, -day, 
what we really know or understand about that hole in which we live is about this number here. So if, if you know what this number would be, 0. 0.0000 whatever 1%, um, then, then you're a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> because, um, you know, not only do I know not, not know what this number is, I also, you know, know that I don't know a tremendous amount about reality. But if we situate ourselves within this reality, and this is something that we do in mentalizing imagery therapy with our research participants and even our older adult caregivers, right? We start with the largest, the observable universe. The fact that each one of these dots, these uh, points of light here is a cluster of galaxies. It's not one galaxy, it's a cluster of millions of galaxies. Um, and um, if you zoom into our own galaxy, what you notice is that there are billions of stars and planets, and we exist on a, on a spiral arm of it, right? If you go closer, um, you can finally grapple with the size of our Earth um, and ourselves on it. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, at least the people at USC are are over here. Uh, <laughs> I'm somewhere over here. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe if I squint, I can I can see you, Rael. I can see some of the other people in the audience there in that globe. And we're faced with this absolutely extraordinary diversity, right? Diversity of plants, diversity of animals, diversity of people, and and incredible complexity of what you might call internal worlds, of beings who have their own thoughts and their own subjective experiences and perceptions of this world and responses, responses that are opaque. You know, I was thinking about this when I was on the train this morning. I was looking around, there were hundreds of people around me and you know, all different racial groups and ethnicities. And just reflecting on the fact that, you know, I knew nothing about their internal world. I would never be able to know everything about it. And yet we live in this universe that just creates all of these worlds somehow, somehow creates them. And then if we look beneath the surface of, what's, of what we can see visibly, macroscopically, we start to see some similarities at the level of cells, um, at the level of DNA that were more than 99%, 99.5% alike, genetically identical, each of us to everyone else, me to every other person on that train. Um, if you take it even deeper to the level of, of atoms, right? They're, they're essentially indistinguishable. Um, and that the subatomic particles underlying all of this are moving at nearly 99% of the speed of light, right? Creating us, creating these macromolecules, cells, systems, organs, um, and that that somehow creates an organism that interacts with other organisms. And it's truly remarkable. And as I had alluded to, coming from a power, right? And this is a, an art, artist's rendition of that, of that one power. But I think it's important to reflect on, reflect on the fact that that power that moves those subatomic particles that are moving your bloodstream and making up your flesh, you know, that's not something you did, right? That's something you're, you're a result of that. Right? You're a result of that energy. You're, the, you're connected to it deeply, the outgrowth of it. And the source of that, people have different beliefs about. They have different opinions about. Some people feel like it's an ill-posed question. Um, regardless of what that is, right? at the level of what's observable, we're all connected. But then there's a problem, right? And the problem is that we cannot see that connectedness. We cannot grasp the whole. And why can't we grasp the whole from 
from the outside, what we see with our eyes, to our feelings, to our other people's subjective internal realities. Well, it kind of starts with this, <sighs> right? We, we evolved as, uh, as fish, as sharks eating each other. We still have remnants of, um, of this ancient phylogeny in our brain. When we emerged onto land, the situation was not much different. And then even as human beings developed and evolved, this is uh, an image of the colonial takeover of the land on which I am on, the stolen land of the Wampanoag Native Americans. And we have this incredible cortex that can become dissociated from emotions in a way that um, we can do much more horrible things than can our ancestors, um, our great grandmothers and grandfathers and these other images. And we can also do wonderful things. And um, I think it's important to reflect on this because it illustrates the scope of the problem, right? The scope of what we want to be able to do when, for example, it comes to interacting with this world in a way that's healed, that's whole, that's respectful of others, where we're acting the way we want to, we're having the kinds of reactions we want to have, where we're contributing and a part of the solution. And all of this trauma is in ways encoded into our brains. And all of it results in us having these brains and these neural systems that are evolved to fight, to distinguish, to gather resources, um, and not necessarily to be how we want, not necessarily uh, to be present to all of the connections of everything and to experience what that's like. Now, this is a diagram that we actually show people within mentalizing imagery therapy. We show people um, this idea that we are connected and that we're connected even through apparent differences illustrated through, through the lines here the self, loved ones, communities, or environment, or source. Um, so, you know, that it appears to be very separate. But in fact, beneath the surface, there's a lot of connectivity here. And, um, you know, some of our greatest thinkers have reflected on this, right? So, uh, so this quote um, is also shared with participants in mentalizing imagery therapy. A human being is a part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole nature in its beauty. Nobody is able to achieve this completely. Right? We have these funny brains, but the striving for such achievement is in itself a part of the liberation and a foundation for inner security. So when I reflect on this quote as a psychiatrist, there are a couple of things that strike me and that I also share with people in our groups, that this person is talking about our normal reality as a delusion that's a prison, a delusion, a delusion that as a psychiatrist, I treat delusions with antipsychotic medications. And that's what I teach my students to do as well. But there's no antipsychotic for this, right? For this, this, this prison, per se. And um, that striving, striving for this connectedness, for this understanding is a part of liberation. It's a foundation for inner security, that inner security that eludes so many of us. So this was, of course, said by Albert Einstein. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about where I'm coming from in a philosophical way, but I'm, I'm gonna share with you a little bit more about that. 
I do want to provide more of an overview of mentalizing imagery therapy, or MIT, that focuses on mentalization and contemplative influences. I'm going to discuss data from a couple of controlled trials in the English language and in Spanish language family caregivers, focusing on depressive symptoms and neuroimaging, and identify some future um, um, you know, directions. But so um, here, just to ground everything that we were <laughs> talking about before. Um, so uh, here we have a caregiver, right? And this could be anyone in their life um, who perceives something that's really bad. We'll call it a stressor here, but you know, a really bad interpersonal uh, situation. And what should they do? And what do we as contemplative proponents have to offer them? So let's say that this person appeared in your clinic. You wouldn't know it because it would actually be this person appearing in your clinic, this person who is out of their mind and who you know, can't remember what they're supposed to do, can't you know, maintain their hygiene and so forth, right? So, so you're, you're, that's the person you're seeing in clinic. You're talking to them. Then you talk with their spouse and you say, okay, how are you doing? And the person says, well, doc, I'm really stressed. And you say, okay, well, guess what? I have a stress reduction program for you. Why don't I send it to you? And our happy caregiver <laughs> goes and learns how to breathe, right? Or they go and learn, um, you know, that it's okay for them to be angry at themselves. They should have compassion for themselves, which is a very good thing. But then how do they deal with this problem? How do they deal with this interpersonal situation where there are two subjective worlds colliding and actually make a difference and understand their relationship and get into it and figure out how they're going to change things so that they don't have to get that angry in the first place? right? So how are they going to cope? And how are we going to prevent them from getting to this place where they're burnt out and depressed? And in the situation of a caregiver, they do have higher rates of depression. They have higher rates of suicidality than the general population. It's really very difficult for them. So what mentalizing imagery therapy tries to do is to do, do what we call balanced mentalizing, and I'm going to define that for you, and to focus on our ecological connectedness because it's inspiring to people. It's calming and inspiring, and they can feel a sense of awe about themselves even when they're focusing within some of the meditations on these very difficult situations, when they're really trying to deal with the meat of the relationship, right? So for for caregivers, um, uh, we, we deliver MIT, and the acronym for it, in four weekly two-hour sessions, have them do homework about 30 minutes a day. We have exercises to reduce emotional arousal and increase mindfulness, which is very important to help support the process of mentalizing. And then we have exercises to assist with interpersonal mentalizing and a sense of connectedness. So what is mentalization? It's how we understand our own mind and that of others, particularly in complex interpersonal situations. It has to do with reciprocal influences on internal states. So how I have a thought or a feeling, how I express that to you, how you receive or perceive it, what emotion that triggers in you, how you then respond to me, how I see you, how I then feel, how I respond to that. So these very complex social dynamics, that's really what mentalization is about, is understanding those and understanding ourselves as agentic beings in the process who are doing things for reasons, not just because. And mentalization was really brought to the forefront of uh, psychology by Peter Fonagy at University College of London, who's a psychoanalyst and the director of the Anna Freud Center for Psychoanalysis there and studied 
the development of mentalization within attachment relationships, within the context of a child with their parent and how their parent might reflect back and help them to understand their mental states and help the child to understand their own mental states and so forth. Um, in, in the absence of that, of a supportive um, um, type of attachment relationship that mentalizing often did not develop and would result in various aspects of psychopathology, including uh, symptoms of anxiety and in interpersonal relationships when people don't know what's going on, and even very severe disturbances such as borderline personality disorder. Um, and Peter Fonagy, along with his colleague Anthony Bateman, created mentalization-based therapy, which is a kind of a traditional psychotherapy model a therapist with the patient and they're um, talking with each other and then there's a group and they're focusing on this process of mentalizing. And what they're trying to do is to enable the person to stay in a frame of mind where they can be curious and non-judgmental about other people's mental states, about their internal worlds. And um, this relies, this process of mentalizing relies on prefrontal cortical activity in the brain uh, in conjunction with other uh, brain circuits and regions. And in the course of, of, so, of interpersonal stress or arousal, as levels of stress increase, we see an activation within these circuits. So for example, if someone you were expecting a telephone call from, a really important call doesn't call you, what starts to happen? Well, you start to think about, well, why haven't they called me? And, huh, I wonder um, if uh, there was some miscommunication. You start to wonder about their mind. Oh, did they think it was at a different time? Right, that's mentalizing right there. Now, if the arousal and stress becomes higher, you know, so they didn't call me and um, now I'm starting to get really worried and stressed out because this was very important to me. It was about a really important matter for let's say my job, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to maintain my job, but you start to get stressed out, right? At that point, posterior and subcortical regions of the brain start to become active, the hypothalamus, you know, the amygdala connecting to the hypothalamus, resulting in the secretion of stress hormones and the activation of a fight or flight response that results in automatic and programmed behavior that is by definition, non-mentalizing, it's kind of reacting in the moment in this very fight or flight way. And when people end up in the fight or flight response, you know, very early in the stress arousal process, we tend to see them in our clinics uh, because it shows that they uh, have a, a, a high degree of dysfunction and emotion regulation. Now, when they have a, a higher capacity for this, um, then they tend to be higher functioning individuals. Um, mentalizing occurs in distinct domains. And remember, I referred to balanced mentalizing when I was talking about uh, MIT. And so the different domains are thinking about one's own mind and the reasons for one's own actions, as well as that of other people. It's on the basis of imagination and a kind of internal understanding and projection, which is not always a bad thing to do to project. Um, and it's also on the basis of external, uh, of the external world, what you see, right? What appears to you, what comes across to you, another person's actions, you know, or their words and how they say something it gives you an idea about their mind. Um, it has to do with both cognitions and emotions. You know, so it's not a purely cognitive process. It's not just theory of mind, okay? But it's also not just empathy, which is more usually used to refer to an emotional understanding of another. It also has to do with their thoughts. And sometimes we do it intentionally. We mentalize intentionally. Sometimes we do so automatically underneath the surface. We know, for example, when another person wants to talk in a conversation. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things about uh, uh, let's let's think about our practices now, mindfulness types of practices, a breath focused practice. So I would contend that a breath focused type of practice really focuses a person on certain aspects or or domains of mentalizing, but not on others. 
Then there are other practices that have been introduced in the realm of mindfulness therapies, such as compassion-based practices, which also have to do with understanding, for example, other people's emotions, but not necessarily targets external mentalizing. So for example, why is someone reacting to me the way that they are, right? Our compassion-focused practices don't really address those kinds of questions. And so in order to really function at a high level in interpersonal relationships, balance is needed between these polarities, between our skill levels. And one of the things that Tanya Sanger's work um, in Germany on mindfulness has really elegantly shown is that um, the kinds of practices that we do, the kinds of ways that we use our mindfulness time is reflective within the neural circuits that become activated, right? So if we're focusing on our own self from the inside, our own, the perceptions of our own consciousness sitting on a chair, which I would say largely evokes, you know, cognitive uh, processing. It's not the kind of in-depth emotions that arise when, you know, Marge sees Homer, uh, uh, you know, drunk and passed out. Right, that's that, you know, those are some really strong emotions that get triggered interpersonally there. That, you know, it, it just doesn't happen as much on the meditation cushion. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that for myself as well. You know, and it, it's a controlled fashion um, when we're sitting and we're meditating. And, um, you know, so, so some of the, the lions of mindfulness have recognized this that there's this kind of uh, difficulty with the sitting practice of meditation that often we as clinicians do not acknowledge, you know, and it's important for us to acknowledge it. So Jack Kornfield says, right, while I benefited enormously from the training in the Thai and Burmese monasteries where I practiced, I noticed two striking things. First, there were major areas of difficulty in my life, such as loneliness, intimate relationships, work, childhood wounds, and patterns of fear that even very deep meditation didn't touch. Second, among the several dozen Western monks and lots of Asian meditators I met during my time in Asia, with a few notable exceptions, most were not helped by meditation in big areas of their lives. Many were deeply wounded, neurotic, frightened, grieving and often use spiritual practice to hide and avoid problematic parts of themselves. The sitting practice itself with its emphasis on concentration and detachment often provided a way to hide, a way to actually separate the mind from difficult areas of heart and body, right? So Jack Cornfield, the director of Spirit Rock, you know, this is a picture of him from his time in the monastery. <laughs> Uh, and then a couple of years later. But if you look at these polarities, a lot of what he's talking about is that social relationships weren't addressed, emotions weren't addressed within the sitting practice. This is important when we make a recommendation to Marge or another caregiver like her, because we want to help her with all those kinds of things. Um, so just a couple words, you know, on, on mindfulness, we're going to switch gears a little bit now to talk about the contemplative background for mentalizing imagery therapy. I'm going to go through this quickly because the fact that you're here at a mindfulness seminar <laughs> indicates to me you probably know something about this already, but mindfulness was really described uh, by the Buddha uh, very elegantly, uh, who said, you know, here, when feeling a pleasant feeling, he knows I'm I feel a pleasant feeling. When feeling an unpleasant feeling, he knows I feel an unpleasant feeling. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. Right? So you really see here these domains of mentalizing, right? Internal, cognitively focused in a way. Now, Buddha also did describe uh, seeing this in other people as well, being mindful of other people as well. That doesn't get emphasized enough, in my view, within our clinical domain of mindfulness. John Kabat-Zinn adapted mindfulness, right, for Western audience, simplified it, removed a lot of the transitoriness related to it. 
And Ruth Bear, in the, the conceptualization I favor the most, um, um, it developed the five facet mindfulness questionnaire that evaluates facets such as non judgment, non reactivity, observing experience, acting with awareness, and describing experience. So when I'm talking about mindfulness, I'm really thinking a lot about what Ruth Bear, how Ruth Bear conceptualized it, because that's how I measure it in my trials. So that's one facet. And the re one of the reasons we use mindfulness and mindfulness types of exercises in MIT is that it reduces emotional arousal, right? It reduces that stress response which is a beginning, right? That's not an end, that's a beginning. Then in mentalizing imagery therapy, we use that, right? For people to then really work on the meat of their relationships. And to do that, we bring in techniques from other contemplative settings. So deity yoga, for example, is an ancient form of meditation in which you'd bring images into the body to absorb their divine qualities. Sorry about how the fonts got kind of compressed together here. But, uh, um, you know, in, in, in psychology, in several streams of psychological thought, there's this notion that a person, when they actually see themselves as a whole, that that experience is one of self-compassion, that we don't have to, you know, generate, you know, an image of someone else to find self-compassion. We just need to generate an image of ourselves as a whole, if we can truly see ourselves as beings, as these beings, you know, with the limitations for the reasons that we have the limitations, our upbringing, our history, our identity, and everything else about us, our physical realities, that the experience is one of self-compassion. So in mentalizing imagery therapy, we adapt this kind of deity yoga approach to have a person bring an image of themselves into a central region, a central point in the body. Another influence of, um, of mentalizing imagery therapy is Upanishadic thought. And so some of the oldest meditation instructions, the oldest ones I'm familiar with, were found within the Upanishads, talking about focusing on the inner light within the heart, talking about this idea that this chest contains wealth in it, this whole universe rests. Very, very difficult things to understand. And frankly, I think that when we approach some of these ancient texts, it's something like a roar shock, you know, in that uh, we, we kind of put in whatever our idea is of what this might mean uh, into whatever this is. But within MIT, what, I, what did I do? I had people you know, internalize an image of themselves into a central region of the lower chest and toward the back, internalize images of people with whom they were in relationships with, including in challenging situations, and switch perspectives to embody the other person's perspective within themselves and look back at themselves as if at a third person and then to internalize images of their entire world and universe, like I showed you. Now, this doesn't have to be pictorial. You know, there are plenty of people who can't make pictorial images uh, in their brain, but people can, gener can generate a felt sense, a felt sense of what these various aspects of their world are like, and then internalize them and shift perspective within them. Um, so um, as they do so, people find that they, they tend to understand things in different ways. It helps them to think about them. Now, this isn't a substitute, you know, this process of imagining, for example, another person with whom you're in a relationship and you have a difficult interpersonal reaction and you look from the other person's perspective. You know, that it's great. It's a great process. It doesn't substitute for talking with the other person doesn't substitute for the process of checking out anything that you've imagined and, uh, you know, and, and trying to see to what extent it's true. But nevertheless, it's helpful for actually grappling with it and getting more of a felt sense of at least that one complicated thing that we don't understand in our worlds often, which is the internal experience of another. So caregivers really describe that 
And you know, here's one case study, um, which I think could really be any of us as we age, but a woman who went through our program was a 70 year old retired physician caring for her spouse with dementia for over eight years, 18 hours a day of caregiving responsibilities and psychiatrically met criteria for a diagnosis of major depression with anxious features, um, had tried a couple of medications, hadn't, those hadn't worked out fully, had tried a couple of forms of therapy, those hadn't worked out for her as well. And what she said was something like, you know, in the beginning, I was feeling very stuck, like my life was over, like what was the reason for my even being here anymore? And what I found was that the idea within the meditations of looking at things objectively, but not objectively clinically, but subjectively, but from both of our perspectives, but in a more objective fashion, that this helped. I could see that what I was, I was expecting my spouse to be almost perfect. I was criticizing him the way that my mother had criticized me. And I could also remember as I brought this image of him into myself, I could remember how much love and caring he had for me. She said, you know, it was, it's not, like my whole life has turned around in the four weeks that we've done this program, but I feel like I have a direction. I have a direction to go because I can better see what's going on in this relationship from both of our perspectives. And I don't need to be trapped in this criticism. And what we saw along with that was that her fairly substantial depression remitted over the course of four weeks. It went away and it stayed that way for at least four months. So I'm going to turn to the population that I work with the most uh, with MIT, which is that of family caregivers of people living with dementia. And they are some of the most stressed out people on the planet. Um, there's about a 40% risk of major depression. There's a lot of insomnia. Um, there are effects uh, on the brain of sleep deprivation and stress, including difficulties with delayed recall and executive function. Um, and there are biological consequences such as impaired immunity, delayed wound healing, and other findings in elevated rates of cardiovascular diseases such as stroke and hypertension. And we believe from the data that these effects are worse in caregivers who report psychological stress or strain than in those who don't, right? So there is something that potentially can be targeted for them. Um, and so to get to some of the data regarding MIT within these populations, this first trial, as Rael alluded to, I did while I was uh, still in sunny California. And a um, uh, small study, 24 caregivers, uh, 12 in MIT and 12 on a wait list with a progressive muscle relaxation recording. We obtained clinical data and resting state neuroimaging at two time points and studied effects using advanced statistical techniques. Um, I'll just point out with the demographics that most were female, which is uh, appropriate for a caregiver um, uh, audience, although uh, perhaps a little bit, a couple more females than we might expect. Most were white, but we did have about 30% minorities, which is actually pretty good for a mindfulness-oriented trial. Um, you know, they were largely uh, in the older adult spectrum and pretty much uh, highly educated, although I didn't show that here. Um, but there were no differences in baseline factors, and we saw that MIT showed substantially more reductions in self-rated depression and anxiety uh, with a strong trend for clinician-rated anxiety, um, even in this very small sample. Um, and as caregivers described the outcome, they said things consistent with mindfulness, that they had a kind of rudder, they were floundering and it centered them, um, that it made the highs and lows more manageable. You can see some of the aspects of non-reactivity of mindfulness here. Um, it allowed them to comfort themselves in a kind of self-compassionate way. Um, and then related to mentalizing, that they were a better listener, more present, 
more aware of my mother's feelings, putting myself in her place, and really starting to kind of really switch perspectives. And this is in people who are already pretty empathic. You know, caregivers, they're great people. They're, they're a joy to work with. They really are. Um, and finally, the ecological connectedness. You know, I think my overall view of life and the world is not so grim. In terms of neuroimaging, what we found was interrogating the bilateral dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in blue in connectivity with an independent component analysis derived network, which means that it came from a, the data itself, a larger sample, uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless from older adults in a resting state MRI scanner. And what was significantly different was the connectivity between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and these regions of the brain involved in this network that's a putative emotion regulation network comprised of dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, uh, ventromedial, ventrolateral, bilaterally, and cognitive affective regions of the cerebellum. So this connectivity, which we would think would help with emotion regulation, we would think would help with being the caregiver being able to organize their thoughts enough to potentially mentalize, um, you know, was increased in MIT in a very small sample, uh, p-value equal to 0.05, and no change in the progressive muscle relaxation group. Now, if this were all the data that we had, you know, it would be kind of disappointing. But uh, fortunately, we have a second trial that we published last year of 46 caregivers, so we doubled our sample size, um, in, and they were randomized to MIT or, or to a support group. So here we were actually controlling for the effects of therapy, of empathy, really, you know, of empathy with that person, of social support, of being in a group of people. Um, and we did the same exact analyses. Now, again, in terms of our demographics, older adults, primarily female, um, about 25% minority overall, um, which is too little, you know, we, we need to do better, and fairly highly educated. Um, okay, so what was interesting about our primary outcome was that from baseline, both groups showed pretty similar kinds of reductions in terms of their pattern during the intervention, during these, these are the weeks of the intervention. But then by the post-group assessment, the support group's symptoms had already started to rebound quite substantially. And similarly at four months, they were, uh, you know, they didn't, had a little bit of improvement. It wasn't a bad thing to be in the support group, but, you know, the MIT group did substantially better and stayed substantially better. And in terms of secondary symptom outcomes, uh, in terms of the change from baseline to post-group and baseline to the four-month outcome in MIT on the left versus support on the right, we saw very highly statistically significant effects for clinician-rated depression, anxiety, perceived stress, improvements in mindfulness, improvements in self-compassion and well-being that were greater in MIT. And in terms of our neuroimaging, we interrogated the same regions, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex bilaterally, emotion regulation network. And in MIT, we see this strengthening, even larger significance in this larger sample between group difference. And also in a very promising way, this strengthened connectivity, which you know, wasn't seen in the control group, it was associated with increases in mindfulness. It was associated with decreases in depression. So it wasn't just a between group difference, right? But, but actually uh, appeared to be related to some of these clinical improvements. So now I want to just switch gears briefly and talk about some, you know, even earlier stage pilot data with underserved Spanish language caregivers. And really, when we're approaching a different group, we first have to adapt interventions, make sure that they're culturally appropriate. And uh, that was fine, um, you know, within this, uh, this sample of 12 caregivers, all female, uh, ages 38 to 61, um, that, you know, what was interesting about the sample was that 60% had a high school education. So, you know, I was mentioning the educational achievement of our English language ones. Well, this was a, uh, this group 
overall had a, a lower level of education, um, but they still found this to be useful and useful to the extent that there was 100% attendance in four weekly virtual group meetings. They did their home practice regularly. They rated it very highly in terms of their overall satisfaction. And there were favorable improvements, again, with moderate effect sizes and depressive symptoms and increases in mindfulness. Um, and so then, you know, they gave us feedback that uh, was along the lines of, well, this is great. We love it. You don't need to change it, but we need more sessions. And we want to learn more about dementia. We want to learn more about how do we care for our relative. And so we created an eight-week-long program that combined caregiver skills education with mentalizing imagery therapy, studied it in 15 Spanish language caregivers, only 31% of whom had a college degree. And we had fairly high attendance. It wasn't 100%, um, uh, but it was still good and feasible from our standpoint. Over the course of the eight weeks, they practiced about twice a week, which was uh, lower than we wanted, but the overall amount of practice was about the same as in the four-week trial, um, and we weren't focusing on MIT for a bunch of the sessions. Um, Multi-component satisfaction was high, and again, there were favorable improvements in depressive symptoms and in mindfulness. So uh, we've done a little bit of meta-analytic modeling of this, of depressive symptoms, and relative to control groups, um, we see a strong effect size uh, favoring MIT. Um, just if we're looking within group, we also see a very favorable effect size for MIT. Now, with the Spanish language studies, the more recent ones, there was a lower effect size, but the reason for that is their depressive symptoms were lower at baseline. So there was really a, a, a floor effect, um, you know, within that. Um, and so, you know, dep baseline depression was a significant moderator of this relationship. We think it worked about the same. In terms of DLP, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to brain network connectivity effects, also in meta-analytic modeling, we see strong effect sizes. Um, and even for suicidal ideation, uh, that the benefits of MIT appeared to be superior to that of the support group. Um, overall, are the racial and ethnic composition of these four trials um, is about 39% non-Hispanic white, 30% you know, other minoritized individuals and 31% Latino. So actually at this point, we're feeling pretty good about the racial and ethnic composition mix of the studies that we've done so far. And it clearly has appeal to minority communities and groups, minoritized individuals. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, show you some of the other frontiers in our work. So in this study, we actually just took MIT instructions and put them on a smartphone application um, with some written instructions and some audio and a couple of reminders that they got twice a day. And we gave it to people without any additional instruction. And about two thirds of our sample um, used it at a moderate to high level. Uh, the sample was mostly older adults, mostly female. Um, and we saw overall a reduction in negative affect and increase in positive affect, but that for depression, depression depended on usage. So those in the moderate to high usage groups showed an improvement in depression. Those who did not use the application much uh, showed no change in depression. But encouragingly, and this is encouraging from a couple of perspectives, one is that there are people who've talked about um, mindfulness apps as basically being an opiate, right? Something that soothes you, but doesn't transform you or, or change you. Um, and um, what we found was, but, but opiates don't result in improvements in perspective taking. You know, and about half of these participants, even just through the app, had benefits for perspective taking. Um, there was even some evidence of complex reframing, seeing the other person that they're caring for is the light and the inspiration for them, like really remembering some of the loving qualities of that person, finding a sense of comfort in the connectedness and reconceptualizing themselves as part of a larger whole. Whereas one person put it, discovering a more positive way of looking at the negative. And we didn't say, you know, think positively about this thing. 
we said sit back and observe it and bring it into your heart, basically. And um, if that's something that we'd like to be able to collaborate with other people on, um, you know, is, is, is studying this and, and figuring out how to spread it and make it more feasible and validate it, really. Um, so in summary of MIT, we believe it's a promising therapeutic intervention with clin consistent clinical results showing superior reductions in depressive symptoms, that virtual delivery, which was how those trials were done, uh, appears beneficial in underserved Spanish language Latinos, um, that there are consistent neuroimaging results demonstrating um, strengthening of connectivity between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and an emotion control network, and that the qualitative feedback is consistent with our hopes and expectations based on how the uh, MIT intervention was described, but that we do need to validate it in larger samples um, and do so in a way that people can access it, even if they don't live close to an academic medical center. So, um, so I want to thank you for your attention. What I'm putting up here is my contact information. I'm happy to be in touch with you if you have any further questions. Um, I have a you know general website that also has information about our trial for caregivers, where you can um, uh, where caregivers who are interested can be put on a wait list to be in the trial. Um, and I even put the webs the the some of the meditations up on a website that's publicly facing called fernhillcenter.org. And um, so the, some of those meditations you can access and some of the written information, uh, which is freely accessible. So um, I just want to close by, um, by sharing that for me, this, this, this project is, it's, it's about caregivers and it's also about, um, us as humans, you know, and me as a human being, and me as a human being, you know, who's married, who has kids, who lives a li an academic life, and, you know, who has disagreements with his kids and disagreements with his spouse, and uses these kinds of techniques to help himself, you know, and it's about connecting with this, this universe, you know, with these, I mean, it's amazing to me, it's amazing to me that, that, I have no sense through my eyes of what's actually going on inside of my body. You know, that's, that's incredible, you know, and it is awe inspiring and it's beautiful to try to connect with that more deeply. It's a lot of fun. So I enjoy these practices. They help me. Um, and, uh, uh, um, you know, so, so it's been a fun exploration. It started out as kind of a personal journey of, of someone who, um, had done a lot of meditation practice as a youth, growing up in a family with two meditation teachers, um, and uh, then became a project of linking, you know, streams of validated psychotherapies with, uh, with meditation and doing so in a way that could address some of the problems of the margins of this world, you know, and some of the problems of people like me in this world who you know, who have to deal with, with all of the challenges of intimate relationships. So, um, so I'll stop there um, and open it up for any questions. Thank you so much, Felipe. Um, so we'll have a little time now uh, for questions and um, we have both the chat uh, box and the Q&A box, which are enabled. Um, also, if you'd like to um, uh, direct the question verbally, uh, you can uh, use the little raise your hand uh, feature and we can um, allow you to, to, to speak directly. Um, I think what I'd like to start with uh, for myself is just a... Um, one technical question, which is about the, the neuroimaging uh, connectivity. You described this increase in connectivity between the DLPFC and an ICA-derived uh, network. And just 
and it sounded like specifically a network derived from the ICA that was related to emotional uh, responding. Um, and of course, looking at it not as a, as a function of a response to emotional stimuli, but as a, a connectivity at, at baseline. So the two somewhat technical questions are just what was the instruction that uh, the individuals were asked to do while this connectivity was being assessed? And what was the, um, the, the qualifying feature of that network that you uh, were looking at in connectivity with the DLPFC? You know, when you run ICA, you get a bunch of networks showing up and what was, how did you figure out this is the one that we wanna focus on on a subject by subject basis? Great, okay. So thank you for those questions. So, um, so first of all, the instructions in the MRI scanner were to um, essentially lie with eyes open in the scanner and just think whatever it was that came to mind. Um, so um, just allow themselves to, to um, allow their mind to wander in whatever way it, it naturally or normally would. Um, then in terms of the selection of the network. So um, when, whenever you do an ICA, you do end up with multiple networks. These networks we, um, we first, well, we selected this network because of pilot data that we had using, that we used a seed connectivity approach on um, using a seed in the DLPFC and seeing kind of where it connected to, um, you know, in response to MIT. And so, so then we look to see within our ICA derived networks, what has the greatest involvement of DLPFC and what has the greatest involvement of some of these other regions that we're seeing with the seed-based uh, connectivity approach. Got it. So uh, it, not necessarily corresponding to one of those canonical, like um, the uh, uh, central executive network of, of which the DLPFC is already kind of a part. So you would think probably another kind of that, but um, the salience network or the um, uh, the default mode network, uh, but really a, a network that shows up uh, and has the sensitivity to connectivity with the DLPFC and the data already. Yes, that that's correct. So within the ICA derived networks, we didn't we we observed some evidence of partial central executive network uh, types of. Uh, uh, networks, um, and uh, but th they tended to be more unilateral. You didn't have as much bilateral involvement. Um, and uh, the ICA-derived method for connectivity um, has been argued to be more valid within uh, su subpopulations because it's more representative of the connectivity that exists within essentially those individuals in which you're looking at the connectivity, then is applying uh, large scale networks from large samples of patients that um, you know, are, are not necessarily demographically similar to, to the sample that you have at hand. Um, so I think that there is an argument about the, in the field about you know, what's the approach that we should be uh, using? Is it ICA or is it um, using these canonical networks from uh, like the human brain uh, connectome studies and things like that. Yeah. Um, the other uh, more kind of, uh, I guess, humanistic and um, uh, kind of implication uh, based question I have for you is really number one, to what extent do you find, I know that you're a clinician who continues to see patients not just running uh, research trials, which involve implementing kind of this kind of standardized approach to the MIT, uh, but you also see people and um, just have one-on-one -on -one ongoing relationships with them. I'm wondering to what extent has this, the, the development of this uh, practice and the exploration of its efficacy kind of seeped into your work or ways in which you, you find it to be kind of not so related? Yeah, well, I, I, it, I definitely enjoy using 
these techniques in my clinical practice. And um, what I've what I found with them is that they they have use and some benefit, at least some benefit, pretty much for everyone. That doesn't mean that their depression remits. You know, it doesn't mean that they're completely healed. You know, so for example, um, one of one of the patients that I've worked with is a a woman with terminal ovarian cancer, who really saw no hope uh, for herself as she was confronting managing this cancer diagnosis, losing her energy, losing um, her mobility, um, you know, having lots of medical complications associated with this that were very uncomfortable. Um, and um, what she found she could relate to within this was the con connectedness between herself and nature in bringing some of those images of, of nature and self together inside of her body. And that was very soothing for her and it was very helpful. But it didn't mean that we didn't do a lot of motivational types of approaches and try to find you know, ple other pleasurable activities for her. It didn't mean that we didn't refer her to TMS, to transcranial magnet magnetic stimulation therapy when our medications didn't work and she was just so stuck and depressed that she couldn't get out of it. Um, so, you know, so, so I, I think that an integrated approach is, is really necessary whenever we're using these kinds of techniques uh, in the clinic, um, and that it's a, an all-hands-on-deck kind of thing. You know, nothing works perfectly for our patients. Um, nothing you know, can really, um, you know, alleviate the entire level of their distress when they're in, you know, really, really trying circumstances. But uh, but nevertheless, we can be helpful, and I think it's it's worth the effort through you know using everything that we have. Yeah, this sounds very similar to um, you know my my experience with uh, using more conventional mindfulness uh, kind of techniques, and also talking to other clinicians who you know have found them to be very beneficial for themselves. Um, have found using those techniques in a group therapy format to be very beneficial for a large proportion of the people who go through. But then when, you know, in a given individual uh, psychotherapeutic relationship, they have a place, but they're usually not the center of attention. They're just one of a, a whole complement of approaches. Mm -hmm. um, are there particular areas where you see a, a, a real distinction uh, um, between uh, a, a something more like a classic mindfulness, uh, um, classic in the modern sense of classic, but uh, mindfulness training, you know, for MBSR type training and the MIT training in terms of things that are uh, explicitly more or less emphasized in this approach. Well, so MBSR is a very interesting therapy, um, and it has had its foundation, as I see it, um, a, a fairly, um, it, I wouldn't say, it's not exactly strenuous, but robust. It has a robust yoga practice, a mindful yoga practice at its base, and then builds on it with other types of mindfulness approaches, most of which are focused on the self from the inside in terms of um, going through, for example, the body scan and really feeling what each part of the body feels like or um, um, uh, focusing on the frame of the mind. Um, and th this is, it's really important. It's really important to learn those skills and really important to be able to do that. And I think people get good at that in MBSR. It's obviously a successful therapy that helps a lot of people with their depression, with their anxiety, um, with their ability to cope with stress. Um, so, um, so, so I think MBSR is a good therapy. Um, MIT has a very different set of approach uh, approaches. So, um, we we do do a fairly gentle kind of stretching that is. Uh, more optimized for an older adult uh, um, audience um, that has some principles of mindfulness in it. 
And then within the formal practice, we really focus on that interpersonal domain um, and on the person in the context of this kind of larger whole. Um, and that that's very rewarding because we end up um, uh, helping people with some of the con intimate connections that are, are very meaningful to them. So for example, one of our Latina caregivers recently talked about how through the intervention, she was able to really see her mother, her mother, not just this dementia patient sitting there with a flat face, apathetic, not wanting to do stuff, but to feel, to see, you know, this sense of her mother, who her mother was, and that there were still parts of her mother beneath that exterior that she could start to relate to and try to relate to more deeply. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of people's just grappling with, with who and what they are, you know, at, at, a, at a level that's kind of philosophical, kind of scientific, um, but, uh, but inspiring, you know, it's fun to teach those kinds of techniques. I always, you know, when it, when, whenever we go through it at the end, um, it, it just feels so good, you know, at the, at the end of these programs. So I, I don't have a ton of experience teaching MBSR. I think it's great, but I think that these are extremely different therapies, very different kinds of approaches. And I guess my last, uh, maybe it won't be last, but I think it, it might be because I'm going to ask you to do something that might take a, a little bit of time to do if, if, it, um, if it is appropriate and feels possible. And just let me know if it's not, it's quite possible. That's not that's the case. But um, is there some component of that MIT practice that you can take us through uh, right now that you know, would would be a, a kind of taste of, um, I think most, as you, I think, correctly surmised, you know, the folks who are tuning in are experienced with doing some mindfulness types of practice, so we can have a little taste of the MIT type of practice and this kind of, um, uh, the contrast. Yeah, well, I, I, um, I think it would be hard to do in this, in the remaining time to um, and within the course, things build up. So we start people off with a gentle stretching and then a kind of mindful awareness practice in which they're um, focusing on their breathing and then focusing on a sense of awareness or presence in the body and essentially trying to identify um, a center within the body midway between the base of the spine and the crown of the head toward the back. Of their, of their being as far back as they can sense. And they use that as a ground for observation, a ground for mapping thoughts and feelings, and then a ground for doing these practices. And so this central region, you know, if you even get a sense of it as you're, as you're listening, it's beneath that kind of normal realm of thought. You know, usually when we're thinking about things and we come to, there might be some pressure in the head. We might feel a sensation of ourselves or presence behind the eyeballs, you know, or it's some tension in the jaw or the throat or the, or the front of our chest. And this region that we focus on in this practice is behind that. It's behind the beating heart. You know, it's protected by the chest wall. It's beneath the realm of this, of where people often experience their presence during discursive thought. And yet it's protected. It's protected by the rib cage. It's protected by breathing. Um, and it's a key center within some of the yogic traditions uh, for uh, doing some visualization types of practices. So, um, so people first practice that for about a week or so um, before we introduce any of the imagery into it, and we introduce the imagery carefully, and we, um, uh, you know, advise people not to force it, you know, to kind of let it come as it will, 
um, and uh, uh, to be present to what the experience is like, or if they don't have an experience of being able to do it, to um, to just kind of listen and be present to the words, and um, and uh, and then it 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 builds from there. So it, just establishing that center. Um, is really important, and it's a it's a really important base for then being able to go more deeply into constructing an image, for example, of self. You know, an image of self that is of your inner experience of who you are, and bringing that image deeper within the body, and and being with that, and being with any emotions or thoughts that arise, and then doing that with other people as well. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, so, so I think just describing it in that way is probably, it's probably the best. That, that helps. Yes. Yeah, that helps a lot. It's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of setting. Um, so I don't know, I, I'd be happy to have, if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question or um, if anyone has any um things they want to put into the chat. Uh, it looks like folks are pretty self-satisfied. They're self-satisfied. <laughs> That's good. We have yeah, very good. Okay. And um, I think we'll, uh, we'll we'll go ahead and and start wrapping up. I'll just mention briefly um, that our next two events we have a kind of a concentrated set of events coming up in in uh, April with uh, a kind of workshop uh, called the Buddha, the Brain, and Bach at the Camilleri Hall in person with Cliff Sarin and his wife, Barbara Bocatine, who's a violinist with the San Francisco Symphony. And um, all of these, of course, are on our webpage, but that's on Monday, April 17th from 10 to 3.30. And then um, uh, a psychedelic assistant therapy, uh, kind of part three of three, uh, focusing in on psilocybin in which uh, David Presti, Charles Grove, and myself will all be presenting. Uh, and that's on April 20th on Zoom. And then we have Katie Garrison speaking. And that will be on Wednesday, April 26th from 12 to 1.30, also via Zoom. Um, that will be somewhat similar to this talk encompassing everything from fMRI to mobile health interventions, but with a focus more explicitly on mindfulness. So thank you again, Felipe, for uh, sharing with us today and uh, really appreciate the time and thoughtfulness. Um, looks like we may have one additional question and answer that's coming up. Aha, uh -huh. do you see that, Felipe? Um, if we wanted to send a client this resource where should we direct them? So I think you could direct them to the Fern Health Center webpage, um, which I had mentioned before. I can put that into the, the chat, I guess. Um, and uh, the thing to note about that is that it is important to talk with people about their experiences and to set them up for what they would be doing, um, because it's often not intuitive to people. Um, that, uh, for example, we're having them, you could say, uh, um, imaginally kind of bring a sense of another person, or their image of another person, and have that cross the boundary of the flesh into their own kind of lower chest. There is something radical about that. There's something radical about our sense of personal space and how we um, experience that. And so for the right person, um, you know, exploring these techniques on their own, I think is great. 
I have, you know, mostly done so with a fairly mature audience. You know, when I when I gave people an application, it was people who were in their 60s. They had a very good sense of self. They had a long lived experience. Um, so these people are generally not very fragile. Um, so, you know, I think I have used these kinds of techniques with very fragile patients, even with people who, who are, uh, you know, have described multiple personalities, swallowing razor blades, knives, hard objects, you know, the most severe of severe borderlines, but in a very delicate way. Um, and, you know, I had enough personal comfort with the techniques that I, you know, that I could do that, right? So I'd say, you know, I think you can direct someone if you feel like this is a really good fit for, for what they've done, but I would also encourage you to uh, consider um, working with it yourself a little bit um, so that you know what they might encounter. So I've just put into the webinar chat. Oh, but that only went to hosts and pa panelists. Didn't go to the attendees. Let me, uh, everyone, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, that one went. Okay. Great. Well, thanks again, Felipe. Thank you, Rael. And thanks, everyone, for listening. All right. Take good care. Bye. Take care.